Welcome to tonight's webinar from Brown University's School of Professional Studies. The mission of Brown University is to serve the community, the nation, and the world by discovering, communicating, and preserving knowledge and understanding in a spirit of free inquiry. The Masters of Leadership in Healthcare at Brown School of Professional Studies is guided by that mission and seeks to develop healthcare leaders for the future. In the spirit of serving our communities, the nation, and the world, we are excited to be launching this series titled Lessons in Leadership, Let's Talk Healthcare. This is the second of our uh, sessions. These sessions on leadership will cover a wide variety of topics delivered by academic leaders and executive practitioners in the field. These sessions are open to anyone who would like to join us, so please invite your colleagues and team members to future sessions. All of our future sessions are listed on our website. Tonight's session is titled Translating Strategy into Results, Bridging the Gap. So let's get to it. I'll make a quick introduction here of Jim Austin, who is an adjunct lecturer of health services policy and practice at Brown University and a former senior, senior executive at Baxter Healthcare. And he will give himself a bit more introduction as he goes. Um, let me advance the slide so you can see our other guests. Shannon Sullivan is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Women and Infants Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, which is home to one of the largest neonatal intensive care units in the United States, in addition to um, numerous women's health services. She is a 2021 graduate of the MHL program. In addition, we have with us Josephine Tynes, who is an experienced behavioral health clinician and founder of Parallels Consulting in Boca Raton, Florida, which provides consulting services to behavioral health organizations. Previously, she served as an executive director at Karen Treatment Centers in Florida, a residential treatment center providing addiction recovery services. Josie is a 2019 graduate of the MHL program. You will hear from all our guest speakers, and then we will open the session to questions and answers. And uh, so we ask that you use the Q&A button on your, on your menu bar as shown in this slide and put your questions in that Q&A section at any point during this session. And then we will um, be ready to, to facilitate questions after their speaking session. And we hope to have a great conversation after that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thank you for joining us, Jim. Thanks, Sandy. Let me let me pull up my screen here. All right. I hope all of you can see that. So, what I want to do is present several frameworks about translating strategy into execution. This will be relatively brief, so I'm going to focus on one or two specific areas to give you a sense of some of the content that we try to develop in the Masters of Healthcare Leadership. But I'm really looking forward to sharing this platform with Josie and with Shannon, real world, real world practitioners who will take some of these ideas and discuss how they may or may not be relevant for their particular practice. So diving in, the reason we focus on execution is simple because two thirds of strategic initiatives never implemented and 85% of strategic change initiatives fail. Strategy is wonderful, but the key is how do you execute? How do you drive change? And so the model I'd like to present to you tonight comes actually from the MIT Media Lab. It's how technologies are integrated into populations. There are many models for driving strategic change. There's Cotter's eight steps. There's Benit Nair's employees first, customers second. There's William Bridges, the emotional journey of change. I like this one because to me, it encapsulates the major issues in driving execution. First, do we have a clear sense of why we need to change? What's that vision? Why are we doing this? And that's one of the areas I'm gonna focus on in a moment here. Secondly, do we have the capacity for change? And I know from last week's session, and I'm sure some of you on tonight's session are wondering, given the challenges with dealing with COVID, how much more capacity for change is there? And we will talk more about that. 
Third, do we all share the same pressure for change? If this is number one in your entry and it's number 10 in my entry, when we come together, we're not working together to drive the change. Are we clear that this is job number one, number two, number three, whatever? What are our key priorities? And finally, what are those actionable first, second, and third steps? Tonight, I want to focus, because of our time limitations, I'm going to focus on the first point, shared vision, and on those actionable first steps. What are our priorities? I also want to conclude with a short video by Steve Jobs launching a new product, because at the end of the day, how do we communicate with our organization? How do we make sure that everybody hears the same message? And unfortunately, we often present slides that have too much data on them. I think it's wonderful to go back and look at how Steve Jobs simplified things and emphasized the main points for driving change. So what do I mean by why are we doing something? This to me is one of the best summaries of a vision statement or a why we need to change. This comes from Sony and it was originally developed actually when Sony was a repair shop after the Second World War. They weren't a, a global behemoth, but from day one they said we will be known for changing the worldwide image of Japanese products being poor quality. It's unique, it's aspirational, and it's a daily call to action. Those why statements have to be specific. They have to call to people in the organization. And they have to include both that daily call to action and that aspirational side. Unfortunately, too often we see these kinds of why statements or vision statements. This comes from Pfizer. And I should say Pfizer has actually changed this statement. But to me, it's absolute pablo. It looks like it was created by a committee. In fact, if you took out research-based pharmaceutical company, this could be for anybody. It's not aspirational. It's not unique. It's not a daily call to action. It's just pablo. One more example of what I think is a great vision statement or a why. Here's Henry Ford, 1915. I'm going to build a motor car for the great multitude. But listen to how he described it. with my product, every family will enjoy blessing of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. Henry Ford was not selling an automobile. Henry Ford was selling the American dream. Henry Ford was opening up America. And he even had this line, the horse will have disappeared from our highways. There weren't highways in 1915, but Henry Ford had an idea, had a vision, had an aspiration about how America could evolve. And secondly, though, so first is why are we making the change? What do we need to do? Why are we doing this? What's the emotional call? What's the aspirational? What's the daily call to action? But secondly, what are those priorities? This was a study done by Rita McGrath. Rita McGrath used to teach at the Wharton School. She now is at Columbia. She's written several wonderful books on strategy. Her most recent, Seeing Around Corners, is a wonderful read about how you can deal with uncertainty. But her study was, she looked at all publicly traded entities across all the major stock markets in the world over a five-year time period, and then over a 10-year time period. And she was looking for those companies, one, that grew every year at a minimum of 5% or more, not a CAGR, not a compound annual growth rate, but every year, 5% or more. Secondly, they had to be in the top quartile of their industry, because the industry alone could be growing at more than 5%, and they're just riding the tide, as they say. She found less than 8% of companies met both criteria. But those that did, did two things. One, they focused on their core operations. They were champions of stability in Dr. McGrath's terms. They promoted from within, they focused management and culture, they maintained reliable customer bases. 
but at the same time, they added adaptive capacities, making small bets, diversifying their operations. They were active acquirers of new processes, and they tried to build innovation into their operations. Now, she also notes these are two different mentalities. It is rare for an executive to bridge both of these or to represent both of these. So the key is, do you have people? Do you have priorities? Do you have areas that you're investing in that both have those champions of stability, but at the same time are looking for future adaptability? And oh, by the way, those champions of stability pay for the rapid adapters. It's rare that innovation is accretive in the short term. Rather, those current operations have to free up enough resources, people, finance, organizational support to apply to those transformative ideas for the future. And part of your challenge as leaders in driving execution is the balance between these two. And here's my best summary of a one-page strategic plan focusing on key priorities, timelines, and link to budget. In the short term, here were the key businesses. In the medium term, they were looking to diversify into these areas. And in the longer term, they hope to transform the medical device industry through these investments. Note, one, clear prioritization. Two, clear time frames. When do you expect these investments to have an impact? And finally, a link to overall budgets. Unfortunately, all too often I see something that looks more like this. And this is not to slam or to denigrate Novartis. I could have picked a, a number of major corporations. This is what I call the Greek temple of strategic summary. At the top of the temple is the vision state. We're going to be the best pharma company. Well, okay, you know, not exactly aspirational and not exactly unique, but there's the vision. And then they have these wonderful pillars. We're going to grow. We're going to be innovative. We're going to be productive. Who could be against any of those ideas? Here's the problem. There's no prioritization. So in walks somebody that's got a new growth idea, and in walks somebody else that's got a new productivity idea, who gets the investment? What comes first, second, or third? No prioritization. Secondly, no timeline. Is, are the growth initiatives more important than the innovation initiatives? What's the layering effect? How do these things build on each other? And finally, there's no link to budgets. So senior management puts together something like this and is so proud of themselves. And then they wonder why the troops can't execute because they don't know what's first, second, or third. They don't know the timing and they don't know the links to their revenue or margin expectations. Finally, over all of this, you need simple, clear communication. I'm gonna show you a short clip of Steve Jobs launching the MacBook Air. If you go on YouTube and download any of the major product launches of Apple, of Apple, Steve Jobs does the same thing every time. First, he says, here's our product, but let's look outside. What's best in class? How many times do you start a major change initiative by starting with, here's what we want to do? I've worked with major hospitals, major tertiary care centers that wanted to be centers of excellence, but rarely do they start with, well, if we want to be leaders in oncology, who are the leaders in oncology today? So number one, Steve Jobs starts with, here's what's best in class. Secondly, he says, here's what makes up best in class. And the slide that he shows is the most data I've ever seen in an Apple presentation. We overwhelm people with too many words, too many statements, too much stuff on slides. What is the clear message 
that you want people to take away. Third, he says, here's what we agree with, and here's what we think is a compromise. And therefore, only fourth does he introduce the Apple product. Here's Steve Jobs and simple, clear communication. There's something in the air. What is it? Well, as you know, Apple makes the best notebooks on the planet. The MacBook and the MacBook Pro. These are the standards in the industry by which competitive products are judged. Well, today, we're introducing a third kind of notebook. It's called the MacBook Air. Now, what is the MacBook Air? In a sentence, it's the world's thinnest notebook. So, what does that mean? Well, we went out and looked at all the thin notebooks out there. Most people think of these, the Sony TZ series. They're good notebooks, and they're thin. Right? This is what they look like. Side view there. We looked at all of them out there and kind of tried to distill the best of the breed of, of all of them. And you know, they generally weigh about three pounds. There are, in this case, in the Sony's case, they're about 0.8 inches to 1.2 inches thin. They're wedge shape. It's quite representative. They compromise, though, to get the weight down on things like the display. They have an 11 or 12 inch display, most of them an 11. They also compromise on the keyboard. Instead of putting full size keyboards in, they make miniature keyboards. And they don't run them as fast as they could because their thermal envelopes don't support faster processors. So we looked at this and we said, what, what do we like and, and what do we think is a compromise here? We think the weight's a good target. Three pounds. But we think there's too much compromising to get there. Too much compromising on thickness, too much compromising on less than a full size display, less than a full size keyboard, and we think you could put even more performance in one of these products. So let's take a look at the thinness first. This is that Sony product. Again, one of the best in the field. 1.2 inches down to 0.8 inches. This is the MacBook Air. Point seven six inches down to an unprecedented 0 0.16 inches. Now I want to point something out here. The thickest part of the MacBook Air is still thinner than the thinnest part of the TZ series. Okay? We're talking thin here. So, it's so thin, it even fits inside one of these envelopes that we've all seen floating around the office. And so let me go ahead and show it to you now. Take it out here. This is the new MacBook Air, and you can get a feel for how thin it is. Yeah, there it is. Look at this. So, in summary, when you want to drive change, have you clearly communicated why we need to change. What's the vision? What's the aspiration? What's the daily call to action? Secondly, do you have the capacity for change? If everybody's burned out after COVID, is this the time to be talking about change? Third, have you, no kidding around, agreed, this is first, we have to do this, or is this just one of multiple objectives? What's the pressure? for change. And finally, 
what are those actionable first steps? What are the steps that keep our current operation going? And what are the steps that we need to transform? And over all of it, think of Steve Jobs, simplifying, memorably communicating. And it's not the data. How many of us remember the five data points that he put up there? Three pounds, the size, the computing capacity. But I think all of us remember sliding it out of an inner office envelope. What's the story? What's the imagery? What's the emotional connection of why you want to drive change? And with that, let me turn it back to our esteemed panel. I'm looking forward to Shannon and Josie's comments on this and I will stop sharing. Please, Shannon. You <laughs> Shannon, want you wanna take the lead there? I struggled to um, follow anybody who calls me highly esteemed, but I will, uh, I'll just take a few minutes to say that, um, thank you, Jim. I had Jim in class. He was one of the best professors that I had while I was there and I learned so much from him. Um, but, um, you know, in preparing for this, I was thinking a lot about strategy and how we put some of our strategy into action. And I think what worked prior to COVID is really hard to make work now. And so before we talk about some of those strategies, what I want to do is sort of acknowledge the current issues with implementing strategy. I think post COVID, it's really hard to implement strategies when your leadership team is tired, whether they've been working from home, whether they've still been in the office. Most healthcare facilities have had people still in the office. They've been frontline workers, but they've also been people supporting frontline workers in terms of leadership teams and backend groups and people are tired and it's difficult to get people aligned in that common goal and energy towards a strategic plan. We talked a little last night in our preparation about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If people don't feel like they've had food and water, it's hard to say, now I want you to go out and I want you to design a five-year plan. And so a lot of organizations are like that right now. And it's okay to say right now, our organization really just needs to provide our workforce their most basic needs of safety and psychological safety and that food and water before we move forward with figuring out um, the next steps. I like to call strategy figuring out who we're gonna be when we grow up. So that's the term I use a lot with my team. Um, and so it's really, it, it's okay to say that people are tired and that strategy in this moment in time is hard, but it's also gonna be what keeps us moving and as an organization alive. And so as we've been building strategies over time, it's really um, thinking about what we call the sweet spot. Um, what was a good strategy in 2019 might not be a good strategy in 2022 for a wide variety of reasons. And so there are moments when you need to, you know, do your plan, do check act and think about, does this still work anymore? We're three years in and maybe it doesn't, maybe we need to pivot to go back to where we were before and think about a different way to address where we want to be when we grow up. Or is this a situation where we just push through, where we keep pushing through to get to the other side? There's no easy answer to that. But it's something we spend a lot of time talking about in our strategy sessions. Is this a moment that we push or is this a moment that we pivot? Um, and it really depends on what your core mission is. If it's something that really meets the core mission of your patients and what you're trying to address, you should push through. One of my favorite mentors said to me, Shannon, sometimes you can't bang through that door because the person standing on the other side is holding onto the doorknob and they're not gonna let you through. So go outside and find the window. And I take that with me always because I'm always looking for that open window if I can't bang through that door. Though, if you've ever met me in person, I really like to bang through doors. That's a habit of mine. Um, and the other thing that I would say, and Josie will say this too, we talked about last night, is really making sure that you have the right people in the right spots to do an execution. Your strategists and your dreamers aren't the same people as your executors. And so trying to make sure that you have both on your team and not expecting your strategists to also be your executors, but your executors should be helping inform your strategists 
and your strategists should be pushing your executors because your executors inevitably aren't thinking big enough and your strategists inevitably aren't thinking through all the doors that they're gonna have to punch through. Um, really quickly, we had a couple different strategies that worked for us and worked really well in the healthcare realm. We worked at a community medical surgical hospital. We had a long-term cardiovascular group there, but we wanted to open a STEMI lab um, where there was only one STEMI lab within 40 miles and we knew that we would be able to save a lot more lives. The way that we wanted to do that was to partner with an academic medical center. We thought that would be really threatening to the community cardiologists who were already performing care in that area. Interestingly enough, they could see the vision of five years. They wanted to be able to provide that care in the community. And what they got out of it is they then got to be academic medical center you know, faculty. And that was really exciting to them. And so we were able to find a way to build a strategy that within three to five years, we were able to convince the state and open up a cardiac cath lab. And right now, that cardiac cath lab has some of the best outcomes in the region, better than the trauma centers that surround it. And a lot of it was because there was a vision. Everybody could find their way into that vision. There was a timeline and there was a really good executor behind it. Um, at the same time, a strategy that hasn't worked very well for us is required certification. We have a couple required certifications we want our physicians and our nurses to get. They're too tired during COVID. They're tired of being told what to do. Um, they don't buy into why it's the safest thing for our patients. And it's another situation where they just feel put upon. We still believe that that certification is the right thing for our patients and the safest thing for our patients but we're trying to find that window instead of banging them of that door because we realize we haven't really met their foundational needs in order to execute that strategy within three years in a way that they're gonna feel good about it, that our patients are gonna feel good about it, and that we're not just gonna be banging our heads against the wall and not having anybody certified three years from now. So those are just a couple examples of what are happening sort of in real life, but I would say that this particular topic is one of the most difficult ones we face every day. Um, I can't tell you how often we said, we said we'd do that two years ago and we still haven't done it. We just can't get people to buy into it. But I've also learned that that's okay too. It's not the right time and it's not the right strategy and it's not the right group. And instead of feeling bad about it, figure out what is the right strategy and the right ideas and the right group and go from there. Josie, I'm going to hand off to you now. Perfect. Thanks so much, Shannon. Thanks, Jim. And, and thanks, Sandy, too. I'll second what Shannon said, Jim, one of you know my most dynamic experiences. I think at Brown was certainly in your class. So it's really great to be able to share a screen, right, or a room metaphorically with you tonight with the rest of the panelists and the attendees as well. A couple things just to build on what Jim and Shannon said, we, you know, we were discussing last night, and I think the most rewarding part of the conversation was that all of us were on the same page with what some of the challenges are um, and what some of the solutions are. I think post-COVID, right, if we're looking at the endemic versus the pandemic, one of the things that came to the forefront of my mind was, you know, Jim coined it the new triple aim, right? So what's the new triple aim as far as a strategy perspective? And I would say that that's the balance of self-care, patient care, and strategy, right? So how are we balancing burnout, patient care? We all have a bottom line that we have to address. We have needs that are met organizationally. We have, maybe if we're a nonprofit, we have a board we have to answer to. Maybe we have shareholders. You know, how are we going to balance maximizing not only your team's output, but also looking at the input that they're able to give themselves and, the, and they're able to give the patients, right? Because at the end of the day, culture trumps everything. And if you don't have a positive culture, your strategic initiatives aren't going to be met in a meaningful way. Another thing that I think is really paramount with execution of strategy, especially, you know, from a behavioral health perspective is understanding the difference between vision and strategy. And does your team understand the vision of the organization? Do they understand the strategic initiatives or are they numb to it? How many times have they walked by that mission, vision, value sign that's in a break room or that's next to an OR 
And they don't even see it anymore because it's not something that's embodied within an organization. It's something that's imagined. It's not realized. So, you know, how much are you actually able to check in with your team and look at what's their understanding of what's going on? I think another piece, um, Shannon, you mentioned this, but you know, strategists versus doers or executors versus doers, right? And it's what's an individual's innate strength versus what do we expect from individuals? And are we building a, che- or building a team to achieve our strategic initiatives based on reality versus our idealized versions of who our team members are? So if someone isn't good you know, one of my closest friends would be okay if I shared this example. He doesn't love to audit charts. And he was put in an administrative position underneath me on my team where he had to audit charts. And I said, guys, we've got to move this guy out of here. It's not fair to him. It's not fair to the rest of the team. He's not happy. He's the perfect, safe, creative visionary that should have an open door policy and make people really, really excited and feel really welcome and really comfortable. And that's what we were able to do at the end of the day is how do we play off of an individual's strengths versus how we think they should be, right? Another, you know, another idea I think that I want to highlight again, something that, you know, Shannon, you mentioned is what's the burnout level of an organization from the pandemic and what's the fatigue that you know you're able to see maybe on your team's faces or even if you're looking at communication that's verbal nonverbal written at the thought of change when you say here's our strategic blueprint for the next 5 years how tired is the room that you're presenting to and are you actually looking at what people are capable of, what they're willing to do, and how are you rewarding the people who are still showing up? Because I think it's important to remember the people that are in the room with each of us, literally or metaphorically, virtually, probably are not the same people that we were sitting with three years ago. And why are we all together? And how are we going to move forward in a meaningful way? You know, and and with that, I would just say listening to, you know, what your team's initiatives are with strategic planning versus what are the leadership goals and are you being honest with what a team's capable of and are you able to advocate for the team that you are working with and bring that to either the leaders around you or whoever is above you, right? And you're able to say, this is what we can really do now. We've been saying we're going to do this for two years, but guys, like we've got to push it for the next 12 to 18 months. It's really not going to happen. Or going to the team around you conversely and saying, we have to, I like your idea, Shannon, of we have to go through the window, right? Like we've got to go through the window. We've just got to make it happen. So I know that was probably a lot at once, but I felt it was really important to kind of build on what was said earlier and highlight, you know, from a behavioral health perspective, what some of the challenges are um, that I've seen over the last few years. So thank you guys. Oh, thank you. What a great image. Do we knock down the door or do we try and come in through the window? Anyway, Sandy, (laughs) questions, comments from people that are online sharing with us? Yeah. Um, so our first comment, and I invite everyone uh, on the on the session to input your questions or comments. Um, and first is from Joe Hart. Uh, Josie might remember <laughs> Joe. Um, what can our collective reduced capacity to address what we want to be when we grow up tell us about the healthcare worker? Uh, are they potentially related phenomena? And how can, we, how can we best go through the window on that uh, sort of capacity to, to deal with what we want to be when we grow up? Shannon and Josie, thoughts? You know, the, um, the great resignation slash decision about where people are in their, in their lifetimes are not, um, is not an easy one. And I think it has absolutely impacted the ability for organizations to strategize and decide what they're gonna be when they grow up. You you made some examples, you said, what about ORs? That's our biggest challenge right now, quite frankly, is our operating room and the availability of anesthesiologists and people deciding they don't wanna be an anesthesiologist when they grow up. Um, 
people especially don't want to be an obstetrical anesthesiologist when they grow up. And so that really limits your capacity in your strategy and your growth. So you have to think about a wide variety of things. And so you think about how do you develop a workforce um, that might not be interested in the OR to join in the OR? So how do you build a PERIOP 101 program? How do you, and these are the operation parts of the strategy, right? Like, so the strategy is we need to stabilize our OR and grow our OR. So what are the pieces of that? What are the buckets of that work that we need in order to develop the strategy? How do we develop PERIOP 101 programs? How do we recruit anesthesiologists? Do we partner with the Brown Anesthesiology Residency to have a fellowship program so that you're feeding yourself? And all of those are great strategies to stabilizing and building an OR, but you also have to set expectations in that strategy. That's a three to five year strategy, right? A five year strategy, really. So part of the shared mental model of a team when you're building strategy is also having a shared mental model of what the timeline is going to be in recognizing there's only so much you can control in the present. I cannot grow an anesthesiologist, <laughs> um, though I've tried. Um, and you can't steal enough OR techs or, you know, or scrubs to be able to develop that in the short term. So really understanding what your capacity is in the short term and then what are all the buckets of work that you need to do to execute the strategy in the long term. As you can probably tell, my skill set is execution. I'm an operator by nature and less of a, a strategist. So I'm always thinking of the buckets of work, but it absolutely does affect every single day what we want to be when we grow up. You know, you know, before Josie dives in here, if I could comment, and, and Shannon, you said something there about partnering. One of the things that I've seen is pre-COVID, they're, they're, the sort of default was, let's do it ourselves. Post-COVID, I see more people saying, how could we partner? How could we share? Secondly, internally, if you said, well, wait a minute, maybe the techs could take on some of the anesthesiologist activities. Oh, can't do that. Post-COVID, how can we all do this better to share? And, and not saying we're going to necessarily substitute a tech for an anesthesiologist, but when you raise the question of how could we do this differently, I just see teams being much more open to sharing. Does any of that make sense, Shannon? Jim, I, it's dead on and I'll tell you why. So a great example of that is when the Institute of Medicine came out about a decade ago with the recommendation of 80% of the workforce be BSN, nursing workforce be, you know, RN to BSN, and then masters prepared. A lot of hospitals stopped employing two-year nursing program graduates. They said, nope, you have to go to an MA or a CNA school, and then you've got to enroll in a four-year program, and when you're done with that, we'll bring them in. Well, here we are, nursing shortage, post <laughs> and right. people are figuring out, you know, there is an ideal state, but there is also a skill set that's out there that could be helping our workforce in an entirely different way to be able to support our patient care. So now everybody's looking for LPNs again um, in a way that they weren't three years ago, but it is a way of saying an LPN has a certain skill set that can work within a hospital to be able to support the RNs in their care that then support the PAs, that then support the MDs, and it goes from there. So I definitely see post COVID a reliance on a diversified educational background and workforce in a completely different way. Yeah. Jersey? I'd, I'd like to build on, on that. And, you know, I think what's coming to my mind as both of you are speaking is how are we incentivizing these people, right? If we have a diverse team and we're asking people to like wear heels and a skirt and scrubs at the same time, what are, what are we incentivizing, you know, them as, and like, you know, not to make it about dollars and cents, but like, what's the pay structure. Right. And I think that's something that, how are we bringing people back out of their houses into the workforce? How are we going to ask them and incentivize them to go above and beyond? Because you're going to have to come early and you're going to have to stay late. And that's going to be part of the expectation. And if we both understand that, you know, how are we going to make that a meaningful relationship 
and a meaningful transaction for all of the parties involved. And I think that's something that a lot of the teams that I'm, you know, seeing in organizations that I'm consulting with, I'm like, guys, you, you know, whether you want to or not, or it's there or it isn't like, you have to compensate people differently. So I think that's a really important piece to highlight too. Definitely. And, 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 you know, Josie, maybe you could also explore a little bit. It's not just the financial compensation, right? I mean, it's, it's a broader set of support or what do you think on that? I think it's absolutely a broader set of support. I think, you know, also my background being an administrator and an operator, but also a clinician by trade, you know, looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like Shannon mentioned earlier, am I gratified? Am I fulfilled? Do I feel like I'm having some kind of autonomy or interdependent relationships with my teammates? What's the culture? You know, I think people got pretty creative during COVID, especially I think frontline workers and line staff, if they needed to you know, increase their personal revenue stream. So I think people know how to make money, but I think they're looking for, you know, how do I have something beyond that? Eric Erickson, a psychologist talks about, you know, our stages of development. And one of them is, you know, how do I give back, right? And what's a meaningful way that I give back? What's my mark that I'm going to leave on the world? And I think when we go through any kind of, you know, generational trauma, um, pervasive trauma, like we all experience with the pandemic, we have a lot deeper meaning that we're pondering. And we're looking at what am I going to do every day at work? Like, why am I here? Do I want to be here? So I think culture as far as compensation, um, right, or compensatory is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, since we've all been working in this um, period of chaos, right, when decisions and strategy was changing moment to moment, uh, wave to wave to delta variants and all that kind of stuff, how do you get people? How do you get people excited about the 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 opportunity now to like? Okay, now we have this once in a lifetime opportunity to like to to think about how we do things um, and, and take advantage of that. Like, how do you, how, what do you guys do in your organizations to, to get people excited around vision or strategy now that it's not like the chaos of the moment? <laughs> Josie, you want to kick us off? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was actually, I was pondering Sandy as you were speaking and I think buy-in is what comes to mind. I think, you know, we're, we're more likely to, execute if we feel like our opinion counts and we're a contributor, right? So really trying to engage individuals in a strategic planning process, trying to engage individuals, um, you know, in kind of a vulnerable place, like as far as what, what are you looking to get out of this, right? Like, <laughs> how are you feeling? How are you feeling about this process? Having a transparent conversation. And I think also this, you know, leadership plane as opposed to a hierarchy is something that I found to be really effective and really important. You know, we're both here. How are we going to contribute to this together in a meaningful way as opposed to what are you going to do about it, right? I think that's pretty ineffective, especially post-COVID. Excellent. You know, and before Shannon dives in here, what do both of you think about being vulnerable leaders post-COVID? Because on the one hand, you want to convey optimism. You want to convey, we can do it. On the other hand, you're human too. And how do you convey, you need time, you need support? So the best way I can answer that is through a metaphor. And it was in the first childhood development psychology class I took in my undergrad a professor looked at me and said, children aren't stupid, they're just small. And I think that applies to a team as well, right? Like if I'm pretending as if I'm calm and I'm okay and I'm not burnt out and I'm balanced, but like my energy is so frenetic and like someone doesn't want to cross the threshold to my office door, that feels really unsafe, right? Because you don't know why I feel that way, what's happening, what my energy is about. 
am I going to, you know, kind of like off with your head or is it pressure that's on me? You know, what's happening? So I think vulnerability and transparency are more important than ever. And I think working with a good mentor and a good, you know, thought partner on how to frame your own vulnerability in a way that's not unsettling to your team is really helpful. But I've always been transparent. And I think it's been really useful through COVID. If someone's like, I'm really scared or I'm really concerned, I'll say, me too. You know, like, let's absolutely figure this out together. This is totally something that's understandable. How are we going to like, I'm going to jump in the hole with you. I have a ladder. Like, how are we going to get out? Um, And I think that's the only way to lead in this climate. I I have very little to add to that answer. I think that's, it's dead. Josie is dead on. I walked into, we had a big leadership team meeting the other day and the, I walked in um, a few minutes late and the lights were down and um, they were watching something and I walked in and I walked to the front row and I just laid down (laughs) on the front seats. And I'm like, is this where we rest? Are we, this is, I'm just going to lay down here. This seems fantastic. And we all started laughing, but we really talked about the need to rest. And so it's hard because I think as the leader of the team, it's important for people to see me as positive and, um, you know, a person that they can rely on uh, to provide stability and strength in times of instability. Um, but I think, you know, acknowledging that I'm tired, acknowledging that um, this has been a long road and, you know, sort of figuring out, way, being available to your team so that they have a safe place to be able to talk about and strategize what they need to take care of themselves is really important. And talking about the stuff you need to take care of yourself. I will not answer your email if you're on vacation and you're emailing me. If I'm working and I know you're on vacation and you email me, I am not answering you. You can email me a hundred times a day. I don't care. <laughs> and that's that's a habit that I picked up now. Do I email when I'm on vacation? And, and yes, I have bad habits myself, but um, it's the one way I can think of to not incentivize the behavior and to get people to relax. Yep, yep. Sandy? All right, well, you guys have done such an amazing job all of you, um, we have exhausted the questions from our, um, (laughs) from our group. So that is uh, amazing. Um, I I will note one of our, one of our guests, Angela, um, talks, uh, we were talking about the, um, the use, how do you use employees uh, who are skilled differently in in light of various worker shortages. And she mentioned that at, at her healthcare system, uh, they started using paramedics in the emergency department um, yeah. because that they were available and um, you know a, a resource that could be tapped into to to staff their ERs and like th- those are the kinds of creative uh, things that we're all having to do to to sort through this uh, and and ultimately think about the future. So. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, especially to Jim for your great overview and lecture. That was really just amazing and spot on as always. And to Josie and Shannon for your uh, really terrific insights and uh, another really great session. And looking forward to, uh, we have sort of a shared session with the, um, the, the Center for Digital Health Innovation in July. Uh, there'll be a session in July, and then there's uh, a session upcoming again with Henry Browning in August. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks so much for joining everybody, and we will see you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Sandy. Thanks, everyone.